Do you like Photoshop? What? I do too, which is why I'm here to share with you 10 things I love about Photoshop, counting down from number 10 all the way up to number one. Oh, and next week, it's all about 10 things I hate about Photoshop. But that's next week. For now, let's focus on the love. This is a countdown, so I'm gonna start with the thing I love about Photoshop number 10, file info, which among other things allows you to associate copyright and contact info with any, and I would argue every single file you let out the door. So why not use this slide as a demonstration? Notice up here in the title tab that this is a ping file, doesn't matter, it could be JPEG, it could be a layered PSD file, anything is fair game. And that's because file info generates metadata, which is text that's associated with your otherwise pixel-based file. All right, so I'll go up to the file menu and choose file info. Notice that it has a keyboard shortcut. And that's something I lobbied for, actually, years and years ago, and Adobe agreed with me. So here we have it. It's just such an important command. Control Shift Alt I, or Command Shift Option I on the Mac, which brings up this dialog box. Now, you can play with all the panels if you like. However, we're gonna focus on the basic panel because this is where the action is. Start with the author. You wanna put the authors in there. And by the way, you probably include their entire names and you'd capitalize their names and stuff like that. But notice that if you have multiple authors, they should be separated by either a semicolon or a comma. Doesn't matter. Either way is going to work. We got description. Hey, don't worry about some of the, these, some of these, uh, the fields seem to be dimmed. They're not really, they're just, I don't know what's going on interface wise, but there you go. You can assign a star rating. Keywords, as many keywords as you like, pound them in there, but they should be separated by semicolons or comments. All right, notice right here, copyright status. You could set it to copyrighted or public domain. I'm gonna leave it set to unknown. I'll come back to that. You'll see why in just a moment. Copyright notice why. Of course you wanna enter a copyright symbol, right? It's option G as in golly on the Mac, don't know why. On the, on the PC, it, you press and hold the Alt key and then type in sequentially 0169 on the numerical keyboard pad, that is, and then release the Alt key and you got yourself a semicolon. I mean, that's a, I'm sorry, it's a copyright symbol. What if you don't have a numerical keypad on your keyboard? Well, you're on a PC, you got character math, utility, that is to say, and uh, you want the advanced view so that you can see search for it and we'll just enter copyright like so and it, notice there's the copyright symbol, double click on it, go ahead and select it and copy it and then paste it here into Photoshop. All right, I'm gonna get rid of that guy for reasons that are gonna become evident. There's your URL. If you got a website, you can go ahead and enter it and then test it using this little arrow icon. All right, so you do all that work and this is the kind of stuff you don't wanna to have to enter over and over for every single file. So drop down here. It should read template folder, but it's truncated. Anyway, there's no save command, it's export. I don't know why. So just export it and give it a name at which point it will appear in this little pop-up menu right here notice mine's called metadata streamline generic name whatever but it's called streamline because it's a it's just a text document i opened it in notepad or something like that and i made some changes you, you can do that if you like you can also streamline it as i'm saying right here get rid of things like dates and time codes that you don't want all right so notice i'm going to choose this up comes this alert message right here you presumably want to select this last one that's up to you you can read you'll make a decision but what I I want you to see here is copyright status is currently set to unknown as soon as i click ok because i have a copyright status associated with my metadata template right there i can see that it's copyrighted i can see that it's got a copyright statement right here there's my url and i've been added i've been added as an author along with oliver and abigail so and i, I have a first and last name isn't that cool? Anyway, I'll go ahead and click OK. And I want to watch the title tab, would you? In the top left corner of the screen, I'll click OK. And now I got a little copyright symbol before my file name. I also have an asterisk after the file name, which tells me that I have unsaved changes. What changes are those? The metadata, of course. So what you need to do if you want to save the metadata with the file is go up to the file menu and choose the save command. One last thing. Those of you who are photographers and are sitting on just tons and tons of JPEG files, are you? or raw files, DNGs, for example, then choose Browse and Bridge. You can go that route. And then you can select hundreds or thousands of files and choose the Get Info command in Bridge, Control-I, Command-I on the Mac, and that will go ahead and save your changes automatically. And that, my friends, is the... the, the, the 10th biggest thing that I love about Photoshop, the File Info command. 
Now it's time for number nine, vector based shapes. Now, as I'm sure you know, everything in Photoshop ultimately renders out to pixels because Photoshop's medium is the pixel. After all, however, a lot of things are defined using vector based outlines. One of them is editable text like we're seeing right here, but a little more on the miraculous side, I think, is the vector-based shape. So I'll go ahead and show that to you. Notice down here toward the bottom of the toolbox, we have the vector-based shape tool. Starting with the rectangle tool, going down here to the line tool, I only mentioned it because it allows you to draw arrowheads if you're so inclined. And then we have what I think is the most fun to, to just show off is a custom shape tool. So we'll go ahead and select that. Then go up here to the options bar. Notice the shape option. Now it may not show you the same shape you're seeing on screen, but it, 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 it's just going to show you the last thing you do, if anything. But I'll go ahead and twirl open it. We got boats. I just think that's hilarious that that's one of the defaults. But I'm going to go with flowers because what's great about some of these is that they're hand drawn. They're drawn by people as opposed to auto traced in the case of the trees and so forth. So I'll go ahead and grab this flower right here, whatever its name may be, shape 43, whatever. Anyway, I'll just go ahead and draw, drag with the tool and notice that I'm getting a squish flower. If I want to maintain the same aspect ratio at which it was originally drawn, then I want to press and hold the shift key. Keep that shift key down, by the way, another option. There's all kinds of keyboard tricks, but you can press the space bar, press and hold that in order to move the flower on a fly. I still have the shift key down for the, what's that, what that's worth. And then as soon as I like the positioning of the flower, I'll release the space bar and I'll keep drawing. Still have the shift key down. If you release shift, you'll get this number here. Keep it down. All right. Anyway, notice that we have all these anchor points connected by these segments. So these are classic vector-based shape outlines along the lines of, you know, well, what Adobe started with, but also Illustrator and so forth. So anytime you scale the shape, then Photoshop is going to re-render all those vector-based paths to pixels on the fly as soon as you release. I, I need to press the shift key, press and hold that shift key to maintain the aspect ratio and so forth. All right, let's say I want to change the fill and stroke attributes up here in the options part. Well, I want to see what I'm doing. So I'll press control H. Command H on the Mac. That same keyboard shortcut that allows you to hide the selection outline also allows you to hide all those anchor points. The shape is still selected. Don't be fooled. And so notice I'm going to change the fill to, well, these are my recently used fills. By the way, the recently used colors. If you're not seeing the color you want, then you click on this little guy right there. And that'll bring up the color picker. I see mine. I want yellow. So I'll go ahead and select it. And then I'm going to zoom in so I can show you a little bit of what I consider to be a gotcha. This is not the gotcha. Notice when you zoom beyond 100%, you're going to start seeing the pixels. And that's because Photoshop renders to pixels. It just does that. You could scale it to a totally different size and it will scale beautifully. But beyond 100%, you're going to start seeing the pixels. What I don't want to see is this stroke. See this very fine stroke right here? It's not that fine at 200%. But that's because by default, Photoshop is slinging the strokes, which I think is a bad idea. But anyway, I'm going to change that stroke to none. Like so, so that we get rid of the strokes, so that we have these nice, smooth, strokeless path outlines. All right, if you want to bring back the selection edges, you press Control H, Command H on the Mac. Now notice if I click on this guy right here, the flower, that I have four folders by default. That's the way it is now. Who knows if it'll change, but there are all kinds of shapes that are included along with Photoshop. They, 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 the program just chooses to hide them from you. So how do you get to them? You go to the window menu and you choose shapes to bring up this panel. You may not even know, <laughs> know exists is what I'm trying to say inside the program, the shapes panel right there. Notice that guy right there. Click on the hamburger icon in the top right corner and then drop down to this guy, legacy shapes and more. Uh, what it means by that is more legacy shapes. Anyway, there they are, legacy shapes and more. I'm going to twirl them open. You may need to make your panel a little taller. Notice the 2019 shapes. Did you know 2019 brought more shapes? Anyway, go and get them out of that folder. So I'll just drag them out like so, drop them so I can see that blue bar. Select the legacy shapes and more folder that's now empty. Don't click on the trash can unless you want an alert message. If you want to avoid the alert message, press the Alt key, the Option key on the Mac and click, and that folder goes away. And now, look, if I twirl open all legacy and default shapes, that gets uh, classic shapes from the olden days. 
which are very useful. Some of them are absolutely great. But we also have these 2019s. I'm going to twirl it up, and we got lots more folders. So just, there's like hundreds of shapes that are right there waiting for you, including I'm going to twirl open spiral shapes right there. Notice that. And I got this guy. All right, I could click on it and then draw it with the custom shape tool, or I could just do the drag and drop in order to move it out there into the image window, hide that panel, drag it around. Notice that, oh my goodness, go ahead and scale it if you like. That's gonna squish it. If you see the squish and press and hold the shift key on the fly to constrain the original aspect ratio. It's gonna re-render those vector-based path outlines to pixels on the fly. These things are uniquely scalable. They are also rotatable. This isn't something you do with text that often is rotated. I mean, you can, but it's not just like ready and waiting for you all the time and you know, all kinds of stuff, right? You can also do that uh, wonderful free transform stuff where you press and hold the control key or the command key in a fly and drag a corner in order to do a four point distortion or something kooky like that. Let's say you're done. You're done playing with the shape of this guy. You can drag it to a different location. If you want to press the enter key in order to accept that uh, placement. Notice this operation will turn this live shape into a regular path. What? Why? What? What is so special about a live the a live shape? This isn't. There's nothing to this. It's a, just a bunch of regular path outlines. Yes, go ahead and do it. Who cares? Anyway, now I got switched to the move tool, which means I can't see my fill and stroke attributes up here in the control panel options bar up here in the horizontal options bar. That's a problem. So I'll switch to the arrow tool. Photoshop calls it the path selection tool. Let's not fight. Let's not argue. It's A for arrow. We can all agree. That's an arrow. I've seen arrows. That's one of them. All right. So now got a stroke. Boo. Turn that off and then click on fill. And hey, I want this to be a gradient. That's totally possible. Totally possible. Just go ahead and click on it right there. Now I'm seeing, I don't know why I'm getting this little guy. Hmm, that's fun. Little, little line with layer that has nothing to do with what I'm working on right now. Notice that it's filled with a black to white gradient, even though I appear to have oranges twirled open and this orange gradient selected, but I'll just go ahead and click on it in order to emphasize to Photoshop that I want to use the thing it's showing me I'm using. And then I'll switch linear to radial and we have this beautiful radial gradient right here. Enough with you panel and I'll just go ahead and press the enter key until it goes away and then I'll click off the bath outline in order to deselect it and that's how you work with vector based shapes oh man limiting myself to 10 things I love about Photoshop is tough there's still more to come but if for some reason your favorite doesn't make the list then check out my five honorable mentions at patreon.com slash deke now and now on with the countdown Number eight on my Photoshop hit parade is the subject command under the select menu, which does exactly what you would hope it does. It selects the subject of a photograph and when it gets it right, it gets it right. And just for good measure, we'll throw in a little bit of edge detection as well. And so here's a fairly startling image of me. It's heavily retouched, but not only that, I, I made my eyes slightly bigger using liquify, but there was a reason. But a method behind my madness, I wanted to set real me, real retouch me against some AI avatars. And so I'll go ahead and turn that layer back on. Now, this is a frame from a movie that I captured using a black magic uh, pocket cinema. If you know those guys, great camera for shooting 4K, you know, video. Um, but notice I, I didn't even take a moment to set myself against the green screen. This is just that chalkboard background that you see in a live actions. And it's very noisy stuff as well. And it works out beautifully. So I'll, I don't have to worry about green screening and all that stuff. All I have to do is go make sure the right layer is selected, by the way. And then go up to the select menu and choose the subject command. And and then you know, just wait. There's no dot, dot, dot. There's no extra options, no dialog box. Look at that. It just goes ahead and generates a selection outline around my head and shoulders, which is precisely what I want. And so now I'll drop down to the add layer mask icon at the bottom of the layers panel, click on it. And there I am. Now you may look at this and say, well, those aren't ideal edges, Steak. No, they're not ideal, but Given how much effort I've put into this so far, I would say they're pretty great. So what I would do at this point is go up here to the options bar, assuming that one of the selection tools is active up here at the top of the toolbox. You can just go up to the options bar and click select and mask to bring up 
the Selective Mask workspace, you might refine the hair. In my case, it's not going to do any good. That hair on my head, no. But notice edge detection right here. The radius value is exposed. It's expanded. So I'm going to change that to 10, which is going to work nicely. And so what that does is it just evaluates in a 10 pixel radius around the edge. We'll come back to that in a later week. But notice these global refinements right here. Now I'm going to take shift edge down to negative 40% should work out beautifully. Do you see those edges? Good enough for a thumbnail, I would say, at which point I'll click OK to accept that change, and then I'll turn on these text elements right here. And that's all it takes when you select subjects using the automated subject command under the Select menu here inside Photoshop. Number seven on my list of 10 things I love about Photoshop are two panels, very, very similar but distinct panels, history and version history. History allows you to go back and forth in time, so undo and redo inside basically any document in Photoshop, and version history applies specifically to your cloud documents. And so let's go just here inside this slide. I'll go up to the window menu, and I will choose history right here in order to bring up the history panel and notice that I'm seeing some states. I've been messing around with this document in real time here. Now you're only going to see history states for your present session, but each and every document that you have open is tracked independently. So it's really actually a very, very pow powerful feature. So notice if I were to click on this guy right here, I would go back to my eighth favorite feature, number eight, select subject. And then this guy is feature number nine, vector-based shapes. And this guy is number 10, file info. And so this is how I created these slides, of course. I just opened a different slide and started editing it. But it was, now, now I can just go back and forth. And so Control-C, Command-Z on the Mac is theoretically going to take you backward. Thank you. And then Control-Shift-Z or Command-Shift-Z on the Mac is going to take you forward. Now, here's one of my favorite things that I came up with a long time ago is basically, let's say you go back to this state right here or this one, number 10 is even better. And I'm, you know how you save, right? You press control S or command S on the Mac. Well, you also have, I'll just zoom out just a little bit here so you can see control A right next door, right? A S D control A or command A on the Mac selects the entire image and then control D uh, deselects the entire image. That's Command D on the Mac. But let's say I accidentally press Control S. See that little asterisk up there in the title tab? That tells me I have unsafe changes. But as soon as I press Control S, didn't mean to. I meant to press Control A, Control D, something like that. Command S on the Mac. That's saved. I don't have unsafe changes anymore. Now, you're okay as long as you don't close. If you close, you permanently damage the image because history only tracks the active session. You're current session with this file. However, if you go, oh no, I just saved over all my work. I am such a clam or whatever. I don't know what you'd call yourself in this case. Then just click right here on open. That will show you the open state or the last good state. Could be this guy right here. It actually one of these someplace. No, it's open. Open seems to be the good one. Or all the way up here at the top. That's the one to do. The one up here at the top would be the last time you opened the image. And then you've got unsaved changes once again. Go to the file menu and choose the save command and say to yourself, whoo. I didn't mess up my image entirely, isn't that good? You have other options down here. You can create a snapshot, or actually this is going to create a new document based on the current state. So notice that created a new document like so that I could zoom in on. You also have the option, I'll switch back here, of making things a little less confusing. Like let's say you go all the way back down here to deselect, which shows you that last time you accidentally saved things incorrectly then you might just want to create a little snapshot and that way that snapshot appears up here at the top and you can name it as well. But then I could switch back to this guy and go, that's slide number seven. And then this guy is slide number 10 and so forth. All right, this piece of artwork right here is something I created in Fresco on my iPad. And notice it's, it's a, this spider hand. 
uh, a drawing that I came up with that, that doesn't have any background. All right, I'm going to go up to the window menu and I'm going to choose version history this time around because this is, notice up here in the title tab, this is a PDSC, no, I'm reading that wrong, PSDC document that's on the, on the web. So on the cloud, that is to say, so Photoshop document cloud is what that stands for. And as a result, we have history. And so I've got all these time codes right here. And I want you to see that I do have some labels. You can make those, by the way, by uh, choosing edit version history, at which point you can edit, you can add a version name and a description. I'm going to cancel out of there. I just want you to see that I have these. And so if I click on this guy, in other words, I went ahead and marked a few states, historical states here, different times of the day. They're not that far apart. But this guy, you can see up here in the preview, in the version history preview, that it doesn't have all the background art. However, this one right here does. And so notice that it's got a nice background going on. Let's say I wanted to restore that version of the image, then I would click on the dot, dot, dot right there and say revert to this version. And that's going to go ahead and load that version. It's going to take a moment here inside the image window, complete with all of its layers. The only thing to remember about this, this is very important, is that these states roll off after 30 days. So after 30 days, you don't have this kind of protection anymore. But during those 30 days, Photoshop has you covered. And that's how you work with my seventh favorite feature here inside Photoshop. Now for my sixth favorite thing about Photoshop, layer effects, which are not only quite simple to use, a lot of fun as well, but they're very powerful. And so what we're going to do very quickly is change this text, quite a different slide this time around. We're going to turn it into this here so that some the first line of text looks raised and the second two lines of text look sunken. It's just a matter of drop shadow and inner shadow. That's all. Let's get started. All right, so I'm going to twirl open the title right here, as you can see, and I'm going to click on number six, which is that white text, and I'm going to drop down to the FX icon at the bottom of the layers panel and choose drop shadow. Now, notice that I have an angle value of 70%. That's the global light for this particular document, which is just fine. I'm going to take the opacity value up to 77% so that we have a darker shadow. I'm going to take the distance value down a little bit to 10 pixels. I will also take the size value down right here to 20 pixels. Now, oftentimes that's just kind of where you leave it, right? You just you change distance, you change size, that's it. I, however, want to spread the effect outward. So I'm going to take that spread value up to 20%, like so. You could really crank it up if you want a very thick shadow. That's not what I'm looking for, however. So 20% will do me, at which point I will click OK. All right, I'll come back to that text in just a moment going to drop down to layer effects right here, which is this black text. I don't want it to be black. So what I'm going to do is take this fill value right there down to 30%. What's the difference between fill and opacity? Opacity affects the opacity, the translucency of everything, not only the layer, but the layer effects as well. Fill affects the layer, the fill of the layer without affecting the effects. And as a result, I can apply a nice hardy effect as I'm going to do by clicking on the FX icon down here at the bottom of the panel and choosing inner shadow. This is still a black shadow. That's great. I'm going to take the opacity up to 100%. I'm going to leave that angle value set to 70. I'm going to go with those same values again. That is 10 for distance, 20 pixels for size. Go back to choke. So it's not spread this time. It's choke. It does the same thing. It's just that it's going to choke the effect inward. And I'll take it up to 20% as well. I could choke it farther if I wanted to like that. But that's starting to look pretty goofy. So I'll set it to 20% and then I'll click on Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and introduce another image, this guy right here, so that we have this kind of stone texture. That makes the white text look just totally over the top. And so I'm going to click 
on that text layer right there. Number six, and I want to affect the fill, not the opacity. Notice what I want to do is take this value down to 20%. So if I were to tap the two key in order to take the opacity down to 20%, I would not only make the text very translucent, I would also make the drop shadow translucent. That's not what I want. So I'll tap the zero key to take the opacity value up to 100%. How do you change the fill value? Besides entering a different value, of course, you can tap shift two for a fill value of 20%. So there's a little tip as well. And that, my friends, is a very quick look, a very cursory overview of my six favorite feature, favorite thing about Photoshop layer effects. Item number five in my long love letter to Photoshop is smart objects. Now, when these guys first came along many, many years ago, I wasn't so keen on them because they have so much overhead. They do ex expand the size of your files and their complexity as well. But I've come to love them. I just have to say, because they offer so much. Check it out. This is all the stuff you can only do with smart objects inside Photoshop. Editable transformations. We saw this a few weeks ago, but I'm just going to review it. Here's the spaceship. Notice that I've got my rectangular marquee tool selected up here at the top of the toolbox, which means all I have to do is right click in the image window and choose convert to smart object. Immediately, you'll see a little page icon. Notice that? in the layer thumbnail bottom right corner and that tells you that you have embedded the image inside of an impenetrable indestructible smart object so it's a kind of envelope if you will a little protective envelope all right now i'll press Control t command t on the mac to invoke the free transform mode and i'll go ahead and drag outside the spaceship to rotate it notice that i have a rotate value now up here i'm just going to change it to something that i can keep track of like negative 22 degrees and I'll press the enter key a couple of times in order to apply that change. Now, if I weren't working with a smart object, this would be a destructive modification. I would have just forced Photoshop to rewrite every single pixel in this layer. But now notice if I press control T, command T on the Mac to re-invoke free transform, which I can now do with this smart object as many times as I like, I see that I've rotated it to 22 degrees so it remembers and now I can rotate it differently and now if I wanted to I could make it very small like so and I'm pressing the alt key the option key on the Mac so that I am scaling with respect to the center of that very very tiny layer right now let's go ahead and zoom on in shall we and notice it barely has any pixels at all I've utterly and completely destroyed this spaceship and its occupants however notice I'm go ahead and zoom back out. Press Control T, Command T on the Mac. Oh my goodness, the width and height values. They it, it, again, Photoshop remembers they're just two percent. But if I alter Option drag, just so I'm, you know, scaling the ship with respect to its center, everything's still there, and it looks absolutely beautiful. And I can rotate it some more and do whatever it is I want. That's just the beginning. Smart filters. I.e. basically you have smart filters now. Thanks to smart objects, you have smart filters, which is to say that you have editable liquify, for example. So if you apply some liquify settings, you can go back and modify them anytime you want. Neural filters, camera raw, etc. Just a few examples. I'm going to show you something different. Notice right here this southern ring nebula layer. It's a smart object. It has a little page. And to it, I have applied the radial blur filter. And so if I want to make some changes, I'll just go ahead and double click on that filter to bring up the radial blur filter dialog box. And... I'll set the blur method to zoom instead of spin. You can see it spinning right there in the background. And I'll crank the amount up to its maximum of 100. I'll click OK, wait a few moments. And then just like that, I apply a different filtered effect and it's still non-destructive. I can turn the filters off if I want to, to expose the original nebula, turn them back on. Oh, it just gets better. Check this out. Filter masks to isolate a filtered effect. What am I talking about? All right, this time, notice the stars layer. The, if I spin it open, right there, twirl it open, it's a smart object once again, and the stars are generated by Gaussian blur and add noise. I'm going to turn off the UFO for a second so you can see what I'm talking about. I'll turn those filters off. See that? That's the stars. The stars go away. Well, what if I just want to mask away the stars in the center of the nebula? Then I'll right-click on Smart Filters, notice that, and choose Add Filter Mask. 
you can actually add a mask to the filters themselves, at which point I'll go ahead and grab my brush tool, which you can get by pressing the B key. I have a very big brush. Notice the foreground color is currently set to black for me. So all I have to do is click like that and I'll paint away the stars in the middle of my image. Wow. Is that as good as it gets, Deke? No, it gets better. Filter blending options, including opacity and blend mode. Oh my goodness. Now we're going to have to scroll down to the ring nebula once again. And let's say I want to take the radial blur effect and I want to blend it with the nebula in the background. See this double slider icon right there? Go ahead and double click on it in order to bring up the blending options dialog box right there. And let's say I just want to take the opacity value down. I can. Reduce the opacity value to 50%. See that now I'm blending the radial blur effect with the original image. I could also do something like return the opacity value to 100%. And this time I'll set the blend mode to, for example, screen in order to produce this brighter effect right here in which the, the basically that zoom radial blur effect is screening the original nebula, at which point I'll click OK in order to accept that change. And it goes on. Check this out. If you place a file in Photoshop, whether it's linked or embedded, it comes in by default as a smart object. And everything you can do with an embedded smart object that we've been seeing so far, you can do with a linked smart object as well. It just means that you're linking to a file on disk. And then finally, Intact Illustrator artwork, copy some artwork from Illustrator, paste it into Photoshop, paste it as a smart object. You'll be asked how you want to paste it. Go with a smart object. And then from that point on, if you want to edit that artwork from inside Illustrator, all you do is you go over to what you'll see is a smart object. You go to the thumbnail right there and you double click on it in order to edit the illustration in Illustrator. Or actually launch Illustrator automatically. And that, my friends, is why I'm so in love with smart objects here inside Photoshop. At number four, we have the image size command, vastly powerful command inside Photoshop, essentially does whole image scaling and resampling, by the way. So resampling is changing the number of pixels inside of an image, upsampling adds pixels, downsampling reduces the number. And so just by way of a very brief demonstration, notice that I'm working inside of an image. I'm, it's, it, it has so few pixels, we can see them delineated by the pixel grid. So notice that I'm zoomed in, check it out down here in the bottom left corner of the image window. I'm zoomed into 1200%. That is crazy. But I happen to be working with some very flexible layers. So for starters, notice this droplets layer right here is a smart object. If I press Control T, Command T on the Mac, in order to enter the free transform mode, you can see up here the width and the height values are 4%. So I have reduced the heck out of this smart object. But because it's a smart object, I can make it bigger. Meanwhile, we have a couple of vector-based shape layers. Talked about those. Uh, just actually a few moments ago. And we can tell that they're vector-based shape layers because they have those little square icons in their bottom right corners. So they're custom uh, objects, as you can see, pointing fingers. I think you can make that out, and a crown. And then we have two layers of editable text. Editable text, you can make bigger and smaller anytime you like as well. So let's say I want to turn this into a big, beautiful image. I will go up to the image menu and I will choose the image size command right there. You got a keyboard shortcut of control alt I command option I on the Mac. I also helped with that one, by the way, in case you want to <laughs> just think about how great I've been on the old shortcuts. Anyway, notice this dialog box and the image looks very tiny because we're seeing it at 100%. I have set my values right here, my width and half height values to percent, by the way, and they're linked into alignment with each other. So I change one, I'm going to change the other proportional modifications. In other words, I have the resample image check box turned on. You don't have to. If you don't want to change the number of pixels, you just want to change the resolution value independently. 
then you would turn that checkbox off and then you could set the resolution to 72 pixels per inch and that's going to make the image let's see i'll change it to inches for a moment that's going to make the image bigger at 300 pixels per inch it's quite dinky indeed even if you don't work with inches you got to know that's tiny half an inch and then a third of an inch anyway turn resample back on and i'm not going to worry about the resolution value instead i'm going to go with percent and i'm going to change the percent value here to 2,500 percent. Notice, I want you to see something that the, the, the in dialog box preview, notice I can make this dialog box bigger. The in dialog box preview looks like, uh, looks very bad. Let's put it that way. And it's supplying bicubic smooth gradients, uh, the, the image interpolation, which is great. That's what you would want. It doesn't matter in this case because everything, you know, everything is vectors, editable text, and then the smart object. So it doesn't matter what this is set to. However, this is what it would look like if everything was just a bunch of pixels, but and, which is understandable. Changing the width value to 2,500%, that's 25x, by the way. And then 25 times 25, because 25 times as wide, and 25 times as tall is 625 times. So every pixel is going to grow to be 625 pixels as soon as I click OK. So this preview right here, not accurate. As soon as I click OK, well, we're so zoomed in that we can't make out what in the world's going on. So I'll press control zero, command zero on the Mac in order to center my zoom and look how everything looks great. Everything has survived this transition because I'm working exclusively with vectors, vector-based shape layers, vector-based editable type, and then that smart object, that photograph inside of a smart object in the background. Now I'll switch to the, the type tool. That is, and I'll double click on the word tiny and I'll change it to big like so. And we have this very, very large document that we are no longer looking at at the 1200% size, by the way, uh, zoom ratio. We're seeing it 50% instead. And that is how you work with my fourth favorite thing about Photoshop, image size. At number three, I have blend modes and advanced blending. Now, this is a little more complicated, but you can preview things as you move along. It's a whole lot of fun. All right, so I've got this seal that I use on my website, deek.com, and I wanted to turn it into this kind of gradient and snow fiesta right here. So all that's happening is a bunch of blending. And so... Let's start with just one layer at a time. Let's take it that way. I've got this grad one layer right here and it's above this blue layer. And so with that layer selected, I'll go up to the blend mode pop-up menu in the top left corner of the layers panel. And I'll try one of the most popular blend modes, one of the most useful blend modes of them all, which is multiply, uses the active layer to darken the stuff below it. And it darkens uniformly. Now let's try the next gradient right here. And the idea is I'm, I made some complicated gradients, as you can see here, there's a fair amount going on, but I really wanted to blend them together. And this time, I'm going to go with an over, I mean, the uh, uh, contrast mode is what I'm trying to say here. And notice the contrast modes start right here with overlay. We've got soft light and we've got hard light. And notice that you can preview those modes on the fly. Those are your big three where the contrast modes are concerned. Obviously, this is not a lesson on blend modes per se. I could talk about blend modes for the next five hours. In any event, I'm just going to kind of, like I said, have fun with them. I hope you're having fun too. Gonna select grad three and I'll change its blend mode. Also, why don't we to hard light? But notice there's overlay, just in case you want to kind of walk through them. There's soft light, there's hard light, getting all kinds of different colorful effects. And then I'll go ahead and select grad three right here. And again, I want a contrast mode. Contrast modes are going to use the active layer in order to increase the contrast of the layers below. And I'll try, I'll just stick with overlay this time. So it would get a lot of different gradients mixing together. Now let's try some snow. So I've got this flakes layer right here. And what I want to do is I want to see the white of the flakes and I want to drop out the darker colors so that the flakes are interacting, the snow is interacting 
with the gradients in the background. And the way to do that is to go, so I kind of flew by this, but these are the darkening modes. The best of the darkening modes is multiply. These are the brightening modes. The best of the brightening modes is screen. And we end up getting this effect right here. So notice I'm dropping out the darkish stuff and I'm keeping the light stuff. And we have these very smooth transitions. Problem is it's too light. I'm kind of blowing out everything in the background. Here's where advanced blending comes in. Double click on an empty portion of the layer to bring up the big old layer style dialog box. Notice these guys down here at the bottom. So here's the advanced blending stuff, the second half of the dialog box essentially. And then we have these luminance exclusion sliders. Folks say they're the blend if sliders, but that doesn't really apply. This is not a title for the sliders. It's a just the label for this gray thing right here. Don't worry about it. But do notice this. If I decide to expose the, 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 the layer below, what I'm going to do is drop out the darkest stuff on the active layer. See that? And so let's take this value up here. Just want you to vaguely understand what's going on if you haven't seen this before. It's a lot to take in. Notice 120 right here. So zero would be black. And 120 is a very dark gray and then up here at 255 we have white so what i'm saying is anything with a luminance level of 120 or darker the darkest stuff in the layer is dropping out it's becoming transparent do you see that that but the problem is we have these very harsh transitions right here i don't want that and so notice this little triangle kind of divides into two pieces if you press the alt key or the option key on the mac and drag like so so at this point i'll go ahead and take this value let's say i'm, I'm going to kind of move things around here i'll take this second half of the black slider up to 220 and i'll take the first half up to 100 right there so i'm saying anything that has a luminance level of 100 or darker drop it out make it transparent anything 220 or higher very light colors the snowflakes in other words make them opaque subject to the screen blend mode i know and anything between 100 and 220 drop it out gradually really starting at 220 and then drop it out to 100 and i'll go ahead and click ok and you can see we end up with this very pleasing effect right here so this is before undo is what i did just now and this is after so now we're really focusing on those snowflakes let's say i want even more flakes i've got these flakes right here the big flakes i'm going to go ahead and click on that layer set it to screen once again notice lighten is very harsh the transitions are harsh around this flake for example you can see that it's kind of purplish whereas it's screen we resolve that harshness, which is why screen is the premier brightening mode. So I'll go ahead and select that. Once again, we're over brightening everything that's blue in this layer. So I'll double click on an empty portion of that layer. Same thing. So what I want to do, I'm going to take this guy all the way up, this black slider triangle, all the way up to 220, which is what I did before. And so that's saying anything with a brightness value of 220 or darker, which is pretty much the entire layer, really, except for the flakes, is going to turn transparent. I don't want these harsh transitions. Notice that right there in the D, you can see that's a very harsh transition right there. And so I'll press the Alt key once again. Option key on the Mac, that allows you to split the sliders so you have what's known as fuzziness is what this is called. And I'm going to take this guy down to 80. So anything that has a luminous level of 80 or darker, which is very dark, is going to become transparent. Anything between 80 and 220 is gradually becoming more opaque, subject to the blend mode, which is set to screen, at which point I'll click OK in order to accept that change. And we have this effect right here. And that is why I love blend modes, which you can change anytime you like. They're entirely per parametric, which means they rely on uh, numerical parameters as well as in our case these blend mode parameters so you can change your mind anytime you like entirely non-destructive here inside photoshop 10 things i love about photoshop number two layer masks and there are two varieties of layer masks by the way the conventional pixel based layer masks which is what's meant when people just refer to layer mask in general pixel based layer masks are great for soft transitions soft brush strokes gradients that kind of thing however if you want a nice sharp transition and you want it to be resolution independent so you can scale it as well then you want a vector based layer mask and i'm going to show you examples of 
of both. So here's my blended image so far, too much snow. And here's the effect I'm going for. Notice up here at the top of the layers panel that we have a couple of layer masks, conventional pixel-based layer masks, as well as this vector mask right here assigned to the snow layer, which creates the snow on top of the seal. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is turn off that big flakes layer for a moment and click on the flakes, the regular flakes layer, in order to make it active. And then I'll drop down to the this icon right here, add layer mask at the bottom of the layers panel and click on it. And that just adds a white mask, meaning everything is revealed to the extent, everything on this layer is revealed to the extent that... You know, it's it's controlled also by the screen blend mode and that slider I just applied a moment ago and so forth. But now I want to selectively paint away some of the snow. And so I'll switch to the brush tool right here and I'll right click inside the image window. And I'm just going to confirm that the hardness is set to 0%. That's what I'm looking for. And then I'll make my brush bigger by pressing the right bracket key a few times. Notice that the foreground color is set to black in my case. And so if I want to paint away this central area of snowflakes, all I have to do is click like so. Notice that. And that creates a big black dollop of paint. You can see that witnessed here in this thumbnail, this layer mask thumbnail here inside the layers panel. And that goes ahead and temporarily paints that stuff away, those flakes. But if you want to bring them back, then just tap the X key to swap the foreground and background color so you'll be painting with white. Reduce the size of the brush, in my case, by pressing the left bracket key and paint right there in the center. All right, now I'll press the X key in order to reverse, in order to swap the foreground and background colors. So I will once again be painting with black. And I'll reduce the size of my cursor by pressing the left bracket key. And I will just paint in a few spots here in order to make some of this text more legible. Well... Uh, maintaining all the snow. I really want it to look very snowy, don't you know? Like that. All right, now let's add some more snow in the form of the layer above the big flakes layer. Now let's say you want to you want to use the layer mask you've created so far as a jumping off point. You can duplicate layer masks from one layer to another by pressing the Alt key or the Option key on the Mac and dragging them. Notice because I have the alt or option key down, I'm seeing that duplicate arrow cursor right there, two arrows, black and white. And that tells me I'm gonna duplicate the layer mask like so. Isn't that great? Now I'll click on that layer mask to make it active, increase the size of my brush right here and paint like so in order to paint some of these big flakes away. And again, totally up to you how you decide to do it. I'm going to switch back to this layer mask right there because I don't want this thing. All right, I'll paint that away. All right, now for the snow. Now notice right here, I'll click on that snow layer to select it. And we've got this big bunch of snow that wants to sit on top of the seal. So I want to mask away everything that's inside the seal. Well, the seal is actually an Illustrator smart object. So it's vector based already. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to turn that snow layer off for a moment, click on it to make it active, and I'll go ahead and select the ellipse tool, which is a vector-based shape layer. Well, it's going to create. It's going to result in a vector-based shape layer. And so I'll start at the center right there. And as I'm dragging, I'll press and hold the Alt key or the Option key on the Mac. So I'm creating the ellipse from the center outward, and I'll also press the Shift key. So I'm constraining the ellipse to a perfect circle. And I might use the space bar to kind of just move it ever so slightly into place like so i want it to align very nicely with the seal as we're seeing here this not the animal seal but the seal of deke there and this looks good so i now have a i don't want that i have a big black circle and the reason that it, it seems to be blending in with everything else with the snow in particular is because the snow layers are set to the screen blend mode and we've got those slider settings and all that. All right, now what I want to do is press, well, I'll go ahead and switch to the arrow tool. The one Photoshop calls the path selection tool. It's got a keyboard shortcut of A for arrow. I'll switch to that ellipse layer. I'll make sure that this circle is selected, so I'll click on it. And then all you need to do is cut that shape. Go to the edit menu and cut it because we need to get it into the clipboard. So control X, command X on the Mac. Now turn on the snow layer. Notice that shape layer went away. Turn on the snow layer. And instead of clicking on the add layer mask icon down here at the bottom of the layers panel, you want to press the control key 
or the command key on the Mac. I know, but that's just what you do. Press the control key or the command key on the Mac and click, and that will create, it looks just like a standard layer mask, it's white. However, it's actually waiting for the vector. And now what I'll do is return to the edit menu and choose the paste command, or you can just press control V, command V on the Mac. Because it's a vector based shape, it will paste into place. Now what gives, notice we have a vector based layer mask right here. If you hover over it, even, even, it, it even the Photoshop tells you that it's a vector mask thumbnail. All right. But it's masking the snow inside the shape. That's not what we want. So you want to go up to the options bar. See this guy right here, path operations, click on it and choose subtract front shape like so. And we get this awesome effect here. Now I'll click off the path in order to deselect it so we can see the snow sitting on the seal. And that is my second favorite feature, layer mask, whether pixel based layer masks of course, conventional ones, or vector masks here inside Photoshop. And finally, coming in at number one is the layers panel. And I don't mean by the way, the layer menu, that thing is a mess. I'm talking about command central, the layers panel here inside Photoshop. Let's start by just talking about what's in it. So we've got layers and objects, including the flat background, that thing at the back of the stack that's created by default, the background right there, that's not a layer. It's just a flat bunch of pixels that's exactly the same size as a canvas. So it does not qualify as a layer at all. Bear that in mind. We have static pixel layers, just regular old layers, vector based shape layers. We saw those editable type. We've seen those along the way adjustment layers and dynamic fills, which include solid color gradients and pattern layers, smart objects, saw them video layers, whatever, and then groups and artboards. And so that's just the beginning. However, we also have inline properties and icons. And these are the things, by the way, that exist here in the layers panel along with the various layers. Notice the effects, for example, the smart filters. These are the things that are inline either vertically or horizontally, such as that vector mask right there and that link icon. And those include these guys right here, pixel based layer mask. We just saw those vector mask, saw those two link and lock icons, just saw the link clipping mask indicator. Holy moly, that's this thing right here. Notice this layers levels adjustment layer that is, is clipped inside the stars layer. You can see that's the case because of this little indicator right there, the little kind of over to the left and down arrow. If I didn't want to clip it, I'd press the alt key or the option key on the Mac. Notice that changes my cursor and I'd click between those layers and now it's unclipped and it's affecting that adjustment layer is affecting everything below it. That's not what I want. So I would once again, clip it by pressing the alt key or the option key on the Mac and clicking that intersecting line once again. So notice that the indicator has gone away, but as soon as I alt or option click, it comes back. What else? We've got layer effects, saw those, smart filter, saw those, visibility, that's just the eyeball right there. I just want to draw your attention to it. It is there. I'm trying to be thorough and expand and contract with the twirly triangle. That is this thing right here. So notice it's associated with this labels group in this case for what it's worth. And if I click on it, it twirls open. So it expands the group. And then if I click it again, it twirls close. It collapses a group, but that's not all. We also have these uses and assignments. So these things that you can do with the layers panel, you can change the opacity and fill opacity. We saw that blend modes, of course, stacking order. You can drag layers up and down the stack as much as you like delete. If you select a layer and hit the backspace key, that gets rid of it. Duplicate. If you press control J or command J on the Mac, you duplicate the layer, or as I like to call it, jump it because of the J after all. Rename, just double click on an existing layer name and give it a new one. Merge and group layers and filter by kind. What's that last one? Well, up here at the top, notice these items right here. Let's say I only want to see the smart objects inside this, this uh, document right here. And so if I click on this smart object icon right here, then I'll just see those layers. If I want to bring back all the other ones, I will click on that icon again. And so here's my conclusion for what it's worth. Mind you, I don't have any click data, but I'm guessing something like half of what you spend your day doing in Photoshop happens in the layers panel, which is why in my opinion, 
the number one of my top 10 things that I love about Photoshop is the layers panel. Thank you so much for watching. Feel free to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. Did you like my list? What did I miss? Comment down below. And don't forget, I have five, count them, five more great things I love about Photoshop at my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash deek now. Then go to deek.com, create a free account, and sign up for my newsletter. I'm Deke McClelland. This is Deek Now.